How's that? It's pretty good, Vlad. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. And I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the first This Old House Home Improvement video. That's right, Norm. Our video consists of a variety of do-it-yourself projects, ranging from fixing a leaking faucet to installing your own track lighting or building an outdoor deck. But before you run to grab your hammer, let's show you how to use the tape. Yeah, this video contains over a dozen home improvement projects, and they're arranged like chapters in a book. Each chapter is identified by an item number, which will appear in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. This will make it possible for you to know exactly where you are minute by minute. Hey, please note that a complete listing of the projects, arranged in categorical order, and the corresponding item number is printed on the back of the box your cassette came in, as well as right here in the table of contents. Let's begin. You know, if a burglar wants to get in, he'll get in, especially when there's glass in the door. One way to slow him down is to have a double key deadbolt such as this. The only problem is that in an emergency, if the key's not in the door, it could slow you down. Now there's an improved version. Norm's installing one on the back side. Well, Norm, what's so special about this lock set? Well, Bob, this is a combination passage and deadbolt which is coupled together by this plate, which is an anti-panic device, so that if you have to exit in an emergency, it's very easy to throw the bolt. All right, and we'll be installing it on our back door here. What's the first step? The first thing is to remove the existing hardware, and that's best done from the inside. Okay. With a screwdriver. the latch out. Now every lock set comes with a template for drilling all the holes. Mm -hmm. Here we already have one hole drilled. That's right, we have the hole for the knob, so it will just align the template over the hole, and you can line that up. That's it. Okay, and now I use an awl to mark the center of the deadbolt in the face of the door as well as on the edge of the door. Now to drill the hole, I use an ordinary electric drill equipped with a hole saw, which is simply a pilot drill and a series of cutters. And in this case, it's an inch and a half diameter cutter, which we simply align on the door, making sure that it's perpendicular with the face of the door. Now we'll finish drilling the hole from this side. Which prevents any splintering. Okay. Now we'll drill another hole in the end of the door with another bit. Now I'll wedge the door halfway open and use a speed bit, in this case a 7 8 inch speed bit, to bore a hole through the edge of the door making sure that it's perfectly straight. The trick here is to drill it not so deep as to hit that glass. Now we're ready to install the two bolts, the bottom one for the latch and the top one for the deadbolt. And to do that, I use a sharp utility knife to score the outline of the plate. And I use a nice sharp one inch chisel to excavate the wood. Okay. 
Good. Okay, and now for the rest of the lock assembly knob. And the deadbolt. Now this back plate. Pretty much just following <coughs> the instructions that come with the lock. Now the inside plate. Should be lined up. Right. There you go. Okay, just gotta catch this. Okay, and the inside knob. Now the next thing to do is drill a hole in the jam for this deadbolt. And I'll mark the end of it with some old lipstick. Hmm. And you've got a nice pink mark. Now what? Now I have to drill a couple holes. The next step is to mortise this plate into the jam using the utility knife again. Now using our one inch chisel again, we excavate the wood. This plate for the deadbolt requires two extra long screws, which will go right into the studs. And for that, I have to drill some pilot holes. This soap will make the screws a lot easier to drive in. and then dress it up. Nice job, Norm. That deadbolt won't go anywhere. Let's see how it works. And we're locked, but then with one motion, you can open both bolts. And of course, on the way out, one key, and security's back on. Wonderful. We never had a problem with the door until we got the rug. Now look. Okay. Well, that's simple to fix. The only thing you can do is to cut the bottom of the door. Now, it, we need about three quarters of an inch gap between the floor and the door to keep clear this carpet. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to use a scrap of wood, put it on the floor, and mark each side of the door. Why mark each side? That's so that when it's cut, I'll have an equal space from side to side. Between the floor and the bottom of the door. That's right. I've removed the bottom hinge pin. Now I'll just take the top one out so that I can remove the door and take it to the shop where we could work on it. Great. OK, Bob, before I cut the door, I'm going to take a couple precautions. Mm -hmm. I don't want the face of the door to get chipped or splintered, so I'm going to take a sharp utility knife and a metal straight edge connecting my two marks and just score the face of the door. What will that do, Norm? That'll prevent us from getting any splintering. It won't chip. Also notice that I've put tape on the bottom of my saw so that it minimizes the chance of putting any marks in the door. Mm -hmm. Now we're ready to cut. Now we'll just take a fine piece of sandpaper, smooth off the edges, and we're ready to reinstall the door.
Well, look at that. Works like a charm. Easy when you know how. Norm, I know you don't do windows, but how about patio door screens that are busted? Oh, sure, we do screens here. You can do any kind of screen. Good. And you can see why uh, you need a little Well, somebody's hand one. went through this one when they were trying to open the door. Okay, well, the first thing you're going to have to do is take off this handle. Okay. And while you do that, I'm going to come over to this corner and start to pop out the beading and the screen. It's very soon just get it started with a screwdriver. Now, will we save any of this? No, it's not worth saving any of this. We'll save the handle. Okay, Norm, I've got the grooves pretty much cleaned. What are we going to use for screening material? Okay, Bob, we could use bronze or copper screening, but that's pretty expensive. Right. And we could use fiberglass, but because this is a patio door screen mm -hmm. and it's subject to a lot of abuse, mm -hmm. I'd rather use this aluminum screening, this charcoal colored. Okay, it's stiffer. That's right. Now, we've cut a piece a little bit bigger than the door, and what we do is roll it out, just going about a quarter of an inch beyond that groove in parallel, okay? Right. And now, using this screen roller with the convex end of the roller, we try to push the screen into the groove. Right in the channel. That's right. Very carefully. You have to go over it a couple times. Looks to me like if you're not careful, you could slice right through the screening. That's, you have to be very careful. Okay, that's good on that. Now, if you take these scissors, mm -hmm. I want you to trim the screen down the side of the door about a quarter of an inch beyond that groove. All right. Why just a quarter of an inch? Well, when we use the screen roller to push the screen into the groove, it's much easier to work with a small amount of material. Notice, Bob, when I start working, whether it be in a counterclockwise or a clockwise direction, I maintain that direction during the whole operation. Around the whole four sides. That's right. Don't switch directions. Now for the spline, which is just a round vinyl material, which holds the screen in. And I'll start at a corner using a screwdriver to press it into place. Okay, then, using our screen roller with the concave end, I'll carefully press the beading into place, making sure not to slip off onto the screen. Norm, are you pushing it in all the way down to the bottom of the groove? No, but I'm afraid if I did that, that I would tear the screen. I'm pushing it just far enough down to hold it securely. Mm -hmm. And you keep it tight ahead of you. Right, just stretch it out a little. Okay, Norm, so far so good, but how are you going to round the corner there? Okay, Bob, what I'll do is take the screwdriver and press it into the corner. It's keeping the bead continuous. And then resume with the roller. You know, just take a knife, trim off that end, push it down with a screwdriver. Okay. Silver. Any excess screen that might be left on the edges, you just take a sharp utility knife and go along and trim it. And that's it. Well, Norm, it looks like a million bucks. What do I owe you? Bob, at the screen shop, that would have been a $20 bill. Just think of all the money we're saving doing it ourselves. Right. Well, Norm, with all the other things we've got to do around an old house, why bother with weather stripping on the doors? Well, Bob, an unweather stripped door like this is like having a three-inch hole right through the side of your house. Cold air infiltration. That's right. So what are some of the options? Well, we have a lot of options. One of them is this metal, spring metal V channel, mm -hmm. which the door will seal against, mm -hmm. and that gets installed in the jam. On the inside like edge. This. And then as the door shuts, right, it'll put pressure it acts, against there. Exactly. It closes it on itself. Okay. But they're not very easy to put in place, because you know there's not much room to actually hit the nail with the hammer without banging this side up. That's right. And once you 
bang this, it doesn't seal very well. Right. Now, another thing that you could use, which is a similar product, is a vinyl weather strip. And again, it has the same idea that there's a flexible area that the door will close against. Mm -hmm. This is self-sticking, so you just install that on the inside of the GM, stuck to it like that. But again, very often it'll unstick in cold weather. That's the biggest problem. Right. So what are we going to do here? Well, I like to use this one right here, which is a heavy vinyl weather strip bead that the door will close against like that. Mm -hmm. And it's backed up by a nice heavy aluminum extrusion. Held very firmly. How do you install this? Well, you cut the pieces to length just using a hacksaw. And you just put them in place, this headpiece first, pushing it snugly against the door. And then you f simply fasten it using the screws. Now with the header piece installed, I'm ready to install the side pieces. And one nice thing about this product is that the top of the side pieces have been pre-coped so that they fit very well. And we fasten these in place the same way we did with the header. Okay, Norm, now that we've got the side pieces installed, what do we do about this extraordinary gap at the bottom of the door where it meets the threshold? Okay, we use a different type of weather strip there, and again, we have several choices. These are all called sweeps. That's right. This one has a rubber gasket on it, which you install on the bottom of the door. Mm, not easy to do. That's right. You've got to take the door off, and unless the door is perfectly parallel to the threshold, this will not seal tightly. So what's another option? Okay, another option is this simple sweep here, which is just a metal piece with a piece of rubber. Yeah. Now, this That's works... That's fastened on the face of the door. That's right. Works very well, but this rubber will wear out quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, the one I've chosen for this door is this particular type, which has a nylon button on the end of this aluminum extrusion so that as the door closes and it hits the door jam, it'll push down the vinyl gasket and seal it against the threshold. And it'll compensate for that large gap. That's right. Good. Let's put it on. half-inch gap is gone. No more drafts. Nope. What we'd like to do in this dark hallway is make it a little bit lighter. There's only one ceiling fixture there now, so I've bought an eight-foot length of ceiling track, which would go up there. Okay, and you've got a couple of these heads that you can position anywhere along there to right. give you the light. Can okay. we do it? Sure, it shouldn't be a problem. The first thing we want to do is remove this fixture. To do that, we want to deactivate the circuit, so... I'll go to the panel. Okay. That's it, Bob. Okay, this can is attached to the box up there with just a couple screws, which we loosen, and then we twist the fixture off. Good. And now we want to remove the screws that hold this bar. Okay, now we pull these wires down, take the wire nuts off, and then we're ready to put up the clips, which will hold the track track is held by this clip, and the clip is fastened to the ceiling by means of this toggle bolt. I've already drilled the hole, and I just fold the toggle bolt, push it through the ceiling, and then if you give me the screwdriver, we'll fasten it. Okay, let's put up a couple more clips. Okay, now with the clips in place, we're ready to wire the track up to the box. And what we have to do is put this green wire on the bare copper wires, which are our ground. And always turn these wire nuts clockwise. Right. Okay, and then we'll take white. Know that track. White, which is the neutral. Neutral. We'll put those together. And finally, the black. All right, now we push all these wires into the box and fasten this plate to the plaster ring with the screws. All right, Bob, snap the track into the clip and secure it with that screw. Okay, give it a 
tug? Yeah, that's, that's good and tight. Okay. Uh, that's a good idea. The manufacturer supplies this two-piece trim kit, which hides our work box. And now we're almost ready for the lights themselves. The flexibility of the track system is really wonderful. You can have a number of these heads on the track and you can move them around and aim them in whatever direction you want. That's right. Let's see if it works. Terrific. Good. Now, Norm, over here in the bar area, we've got this light right over the sink and it's controlled by a switch over here. Sure would like to have a dimmer. No problem, Bob. First thing we're going to do is shut the power off. Okay. That's it. How are we doing? Good. Play it off. Now we'll take these two screws out that hold the switch in place. Okay, now pull this switch out. And that looks pretty good. No real surprises. All right. We want to just snip these wires off, saving as much as we can. See then what? Okay. Here's the new dimmer, yeah. The new dimmer has three wires, a black, a red, and a green. The green is our grounding wire, and we want to attach that to the box, ground it to the box. Now, in the back of the box, there's a green grounding screw, which I'll loosen up. And I'll try to get the green wire with its loop right over that screw. There we go. Hold it down. Good. All right, Bob, if you could hand me the wire nuts, I, I will connect the wires from the switch to the house wiring. How do you know which wires to hook up? On most switches and dimmers, it makes no difference. On most, but it's always a good idea to consult the directions. Okay, now with the dimmer safely wired, before we install it in the box, let's give it a test. So if you go down and turn the fuse back on. Sure. It's good, Bob. Okay, Bob, I've just reinstalled the dimmer in the box and we'll secure it with these screws. Okay, that takes care of this plate. Now, how's it work? Just tap it to turn it on or off and hold your finger to dim. Not bad. Hey, thanks, Norm. You know, most appliances today come with a three-prong plug such as this. And it's a fact of life that in many old houses, most receptacles are two-prongs, such as this. Now, you can buy these 60-cent adapters and just plug them right into the receptacle and then put in your new appliance. But that's kind of a nuisance because they're loose and you can lose the little gray things really easily. So the real simple solution is to replace the old two-prong receptacles with grounded three-prong receptacles. Now, before you do anything, though, Make sure you know what the picture is with the juice. Okay, this is live. Would somebody please kill it? Great. Now the first thing is to remove the plate. And now there are two screws that hold the old receptacle to the steel box. Then just pull the old receptacle away from the box. Loosen up the brass screw here. should come right out. And now do the same with the white wire. Now here I want to show you a piece of electrical cable which is typical of every cable running throughout this house. It's called BX and it's steel armor plated. That steel provides a grounding between every steel workbox in the house and the mains downstairs. But now what I want to do is I want to provide a new ground between that box and the new receptacle. To do that, I've bought a grounding wire. And notice it's coated in green plastic. Green is the universal color for a ground. At the end of it, there's a self-tapping screw. And we'll simply insert this into the box, into a hole that's in the back of it, and drive that screw in tightly. Get it good and tight. Then, at the other end of the wire, simply come in with your lineman's pliers, about a quarter inch, and put a crimp on the wire. And notice on the new receptacle, there's also a green screw, which will be the way of grounding it. 
Next, I'm going to attach the white wire onto the silver screw and fasten that screw down real tight. Now, the black wire, the hot side, we'll attach that onto the brass screw. And again, drive the screw tight. Now, gently push the receptacle back into the old box and use the new screws that are provided to fasten it right to the box. Then reinsert your tester and have your assistant turn the fuse back on. We're back in business. Last thing to do is put the new cover plate on and drive that final screw and say goodbye to one of life's more profound problems. Richard, I've got one problem here in the laundry room. The faucet's dripping. Bob, this is an old style faucet that has two separate handles and has washers inside that we can repair. Oh. What temperature is that water? It's hot water. Let's shut the hot water side off underneath. Which one would that be? It's on the left-hand side, and turn it clockwise. OK. First, we remove the handle. We have to back the handle screw out. Removing the handle is often the most difficult part of the job, because over the years, it really sometimes gets bound on there. Let's see how lucky we get. <coughs> Good. Not too bad. That's it. Next, we're ready to remove the stem unit. With a pair of pliers, we go counterclockwise and back it out. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. This black part is the faucet washer, and that is pitted and scored. Let's replace it. Now, I should have a replacement washer in there. Let me just try getting this old one out, this old screw and washer. That went very well. Okay, let's try, let's try that one. Perfect. Anytime you go this far, you should replace the screw as well with a brass screw. Okay, we're ready to put it back in. And now we just put it back together, the opposite of the way we took it apart, tighten it up. Put the handle back on. Ready to try it? Yeah, let's try it, Bob. OK, turn it on and off. One drip. That's a lot better. Thank you, Richard. Sooner or later, everybody's got to deal with a stopped up toilet. And here's a tool everyone should have. Richard, how do you use a plunger? Well, it's called a plunger. The key thing to remember is that you're not trying to force the stoppage through the toilet. You're trying to draw it back or extract it. Set it down over the opening, seat it a few times like this, and one movement, pulling it straight back. Mm -hmm. Just once? Well, it could take several times to do it. What if you do it 10 times and it's still stopped up? Well, they have a tool that's made. It's a hollow pipe with a flexible cable inside of it and a specially designed bit. It's called a closet auger. Then you go fishing, right? You go fishing. You put it down inside the opening. It has a protective covering to keep the toilet from scratching. And in a clockwise motion, you try and hook the stoppage down inside. So that's the... forcing the cable deeper down into the waste pipe. Right. If I felt the stoppage right here, I'd continue the clockwise motion, but I'd draw it back. Start pulling it back out. Right. What if that fails? Well, the only other alternative is to pull the toilet up. Mm -hmm. The first thing we have to do is to shut off the water. Every toilet should have a shutoff valve like this one that we turn clockwise, and then we want to remove as much water as we can from the tank and the bowl. A small styrofoam cup or in a plastic bag or a glove would make this job a little cleaner for you. Now, that's about all the water we're going to get out of that. Next step is to disconnect these closet bolts, which hold the toilet down to the flange with a pair of channel locks. And now we disconnect the water supply pipe. Well, with everything disconnected, we lift it straight up. Let's set it on this drop cloth. 
And now we could use the auger and go back through the opening. And keep it turning. Here it comes. Here it comes. Oh, good. Here it is. Aha. Quite typically, that or a child's toy is always what you find in there nine out of ten times. We're ready to reinstall this. First thing we have to do is to get rid of this old wax ring. I install new brass closet bolts and a new wax ring to make a good seal between the toilet and the flange. Bob, give me a hand and we'll set this right back onto the new bolts and the wax ring. Okay. There you go. Now the weight of the thing will squish that wax ring down, right? Right. We'll make up the final connections on these bolts and the water connection and we're done. Great. Deep enough, Norm? Yep, Bob. The project today is an 8 by 10 foot wooden deck off the back door here. First thing we did was dig four holes four feet deep for the deck foundation. Why so deep? So that we're below the frost line and we're on undisturbed soil. Right, so the frost can't heave the pier out of the ground in the winter and so that it won't sink any further. Exactly. What's next? Right over here, Bob. These waxed cardboard tubes that I picked up at the home center are specially made for forming concrete. Okay, that's plumb, and I've measured to make sure that the center of the tube will be directly beneath the corner of the deck. Okay, Bob, you can backfill it to hold the form in place. The beauty of this form is that you can leave it right in place. It won't deteriorate or rot, and it won't attract any insects. This dry mix of Portland cement, sand, and gravel is perfect for these small jobs. Okay, that's just about the right amount of water. I want it to be as stiff as possible. And now we're ready to place the concrete in the tube. And with this stick, I'll make sure there are no voids in the concrete mix. Maybe two more shovelfuls, Bob, at the most, because I don't want the concrete in the tube to be any higher than the existing grade, because I don't want it to show when the deck is completed. Okay, now what we have to do is just take a piece of wood and float off the top so that it's level. level. And I'll place this anchor bolt into the tube, into the concrete, so that it'll help us secure the deck to the pier later. After the concrete has set up for a couple of days, we remove the cardboard forms and we're ready to start building the frame for our deck. What's the first step, Norm? The next step is to fasten our wooden post to our masonry pier by using this post anchor. And I've located the post anchor directly beneath this line, which is the edge of our deck. And I'll secure it with this washer and this nut. And the device allows us some adjustment. And we just simply tighten it down with a socket. The next item is this spacer, which we install so that the post will be held above the nut and the masonry. The post slips between the flanges, and then we nail it through the holes provided. Now, Norm, I notice these pressure-treated posts are actually taller than we'll need. That's right. We'll trim them when the deck is all framed. Good. Now, what's next? Next, I've established a level line which when the deck is completed will be seven inches below the top of this threshold. A very comfortable riser. That's right. We'll transfer this line to all four posts. Good. Lower the straight edge, Bob. Good. Is that it? Good. Now, for the frame itself, we'll secure a piece of two by eight pressure treated to the post with a nail and then bolt it through.
Okay, Norm, that's it on the carriage bolts. We're ready to put in our joists. Okay, before we install the joist, Bob, I want to sight down the top, and any natural crown that might be in it, I want to make sure that's up. Right, and eventually the load on the deck will flatten it out. We'll nail the joist in place using 16-penny hot-dip galvanized spikes, three per joist, and we'll space the joist 16 inches on center along the side. Okay, Norm, are we ready for a stiffener over here? That's right, we'll double that one to make it stronger. And act as a double beam. That's right. Okay, let's put one on the other side, Bob. And now the last joist, which is cut a little longer to cover the ends of our beams, and just spike that into place. Finally, we're ready to cut off these posts and we'll simply use a bow saw. You know, Norm, this pressure-treated lumber could even sit right on the soil and still be warranted to last for 30 years. For the decking, we'll use a different material. This is California redwood, which we've chosen for its natural beauty and durability. We're using a deck grade, which is less expensive. It has a few knots in it, but that won't bother us. This material is air-dried. Okay, Bob, that line is two and three quarters inches off the center line. You know, Norm, a lot of folks would just begin putting down the decking material at one edge or the other. Right, well, I like to start in the center, and in this case, the center of this piece of decking will be at the center of our frame, and we'll work each way so that by the time we get to the edge, we'll have an appropriate overhang. And of course, you've calculated this. Right. To fasten the decking, we'll use a 12-penny galvanized box nail, which is a thinner gauge, meaning it is less likely to split the wood. We'll space the decking away from the house about an inch and a half, just using a line as a guide. That'll avoid any buildup of leaves or debris or moisture. Right, and we'll use a 16-penny spike as a spacer between the planks. That's it. It's looking beautiful, Norm. Good sure Not much to it, huh? No. And of course, we don't need to paint it. We don't need to stain it. The redwood will take on a beautiful gray patina in no time. The project here is to lay a brick path from the garden shed door over to the driveway. Before we did any excavation, we picked a pattern using a good quality water-struck paving brick. Right. Now this pattern is called a stacked bond. And the problem with that is that because of the irregularity of the bricks, it's difficult to hold the pattern for a long run. Over here, we have something called a herringbone pattern, which is very elegant. The problem here is that we have a lot of cutting to do, especially along the border. But it's a good-looking path. Over here, we've laid out something called a running bond. And again, we have a cutting problem because at any intersection, we have to cut all these bricks. And at the beginning and end. The pattern that we're going to be using is called a basket weave. And it simply means that you take two in one direction against two in the opposite direction and keep repeating that. Right, and we've chose to put a stretch, of course, as a border on each side. And from that, we determined that the measurement of our walk was to be 45 inches. And that's how we knew just how much to excavate. We've removed all the sod and the topsoil, that width and to a depth of about eight or nine inches. Then what? Bob, then we've got to set the brick on something. We could use sand, but we're going to use st stone, stone dust, dust, which is a byproduct of making gravel. It's very easy to work with. And once set in place, and compact it, it holds itself very well. Terrific. OK, Norm, we've got about half of the stone dust laid in place. That's right, Bob. And at this point, it's good to wet it and tamp it so that we have a good, firm base. Right. You know, although it's a lot of work, it's always a real good idea to remove about eight or nine inches of the topsoil before you start any of the work. That's right, because bricks set on topsoil will eventually sink, and the soil will ooze up between the joints. Right. Now let's get some more of the stone dust in place. Okay. Okay, Norm, we've got all our stone dust nicely tamped. Should we begin laying brick here at the end of the path? Well, Bob, if it was just a straight path, we could start at either end. But since we have an intersection here, we must start at either this corner or this corner. Why? And the reason for that is that the pattern will be continuous, 
in both directions, east, west, and north, south. No interruptions. That's right. So we start with our stretcher course, which we set right at the intersection of those two lines, using a rubber mallet, tamp it into place, and if there's a little bit too much stone dust, we can just take a trowel and scrape a little bit out until we get it set so that the top of the brick is just slightly above this grade. Now with the corner set, I can continue the stretch of course, making sure I pitch it slightly. Pitching it slightly away from the building so that rainwater runs off. Now with the stretchers all in place, we're ready to put down the last inch or so of stone dust. And we're drawing it flat as we go along using a screed. Notice how Norm shakes it back and forth and uses the stretchers themselves as a guide. Now a kneeling board so that we can work over the surface without disturbing it and a straight edge. And we'll begin laying the field. All right, Bob, and we start at the same corner of the intersection of the two walks so that our pattern will remain continuous. After setting the bricks on the base, we take the rubber mallet and tamp them into place. Well, Norm, it's looking good. Sure is. Mm. Norm, wouldn't you know it, we're going to have to trim this last brick. Well, Bob, you're not going to be able to cut these pavers with that brick hammer, believe me. Instead of the hammer, we'll use this circular saw with a masonry cutting blade, and I'll score the brick on the side that shows. Now, using this brick set, we'll try to snap off the end of the brick. Try that one. That's going to be perfect, Norm. Now, just a little bit more of this dried stone dust in all the cracks. And that helps to hold the bricks firmly in place. Well, what do you think, Norm? Not bad for a couple of amateurs. Right. Tell you how it happened, Norm. A little boy in a baseball. Oh, no problem. Set it right here on the bench. It's always a good idea to have a newspaper on the workbench. We'll clamp it in place. And the first thing that we want to use for a tool is a glove. Mm -hmm. Because we want to remove as much of that broken glass as possible. And with the glove, you won't Get cut, cut your hand all up. And notice, eye protection. Now this piece seems to be fighting me a little, so I'll use my hammer to break it up so it'll be easier to remove. Okay, Norm, now what about the glazing compound? Okay, Bob, we'll take an old chisel that's reasonably sharp mm -hmm. and use that to carefully remove the putty, making sure not to gouge these wooden strips the or mutton, mutton bars. bars. Yeah. I really don't want to damage this wood, and this putty is hard, so why don't we heat it up with that heat gun? We could also use a hair dryer. Right. That'll soften it just enough to make it easier to remove. And that's really working good, Bob. That's beautiful. The next thing we have to do is remove these glazier's points, which actually hold the glass in place. The next step is to treat the raw wood with some linseed oil. Why not? That's to prevent the glazing compound from drying out prematurely. Mm -hmm. And now for the glazing compound, which I'm keeping very warm, so it will be easy to work with. Before I set the glass, I'm going to bed it in a thin layer of compound. Now for the glass, which the hardware store has cut nicely for me, about a sixteenth of an inch smaller than the opening and I'll just embed that into the compound. To hold the glass in place, we'll use glazier's points, putting two on each side, pressing them in place 
with a screwdriver. And deep enough so that the outer layer of glazing compound will cover it. That's right. Now for the part that takes a little bit of practice. For that, I like to have the sash in the vertical position. Mm -hmm. And I use the ball of putty and my thumb, press the putty into the corner of the glass and wood. How will you smooth it out? I use a good, clean putty knife. I see. You're keeping it at an angle, resting on the edge of the wood mutton bar with a point up against the glass. And then we just remove the excess by just rolling it off. Beautiful. What about a void like that, Norm? It's very difficult to repair. I'd almost rather take the putty out and start over again. In other words, the more you handle it, the harder it becomes to work with. Right. Norman looks terrific. Why don't we clean it up? No cleaner of paint on this window for three or four days, Bob, until that putty cures. I'll buy that. When it rains here, it's difficult to get in and out of the building without being splattered on. So the project now is to install a rain gutter along the eave line. And our choices are several. One would be the wooden gutter. Norm? Well, Bob, this is expensive. Five to six dollars a foot, and it's a yearly maintenance problem. It's also not an easy do-it-yourself or job. That's right. Another choice would be the aluminum gutter. The problem with that is, is that it's difficult to get good watertight joints, and the seamless variety is not a do-it-yourself job. Right. So we've chosen to go with polyvinyl, a lightweight gutter material, which is easily available at most home improvement centers and can be done by the do-it-yourselfer. How do you get started, Norm? Well, the first thing you do is determine that you want a downspout on that end of the building and one over here. And the first thing we install is this fixture, which we simply screw to the fascia board. OK, with these secured on either end, let's stretch a line point to point. Okay, now, there's our level line, but I want to add a little pitch so the water will run to each end. So come down in the middle mm -hmm. and raise the line about a half an inch and snap each side, and that'll give us the right amount of pitch. Are you ready for a bracket, Norm? Yeah. Now, if you could just bring it up to the red line, and I'll screw it to the fascia board, and we'll put these every 30 inches, and they'll hold the gutter in place. Good, Bob. Take this tape down to the other end, and we'll get an overall length for our gutter. And following the manufacturer's directions, we'll leave it a little bit longer because this material tends to expand and contract with temperature changes. OK. OK, 25 feet, one and a quarter inches. Now we have to join a couple of these 10-foot lengths together. And to do that, we'll use this coupler piece. Now, for all the gluing, we have to use a cleaner. Just put it on a rag and clean all the surfaces that will be glued. And that prepares the material before you apply the glue to it. That's right. Now the cement, which we apply to both pieces, working fairly quickly because we only have about 30 seconds of time to work with. Before it sets up. That's right. Now we'll glue the other piece onto the cup. Let's put another coupler on the end of this piece, and then we'll rest it up on the brackets. And now we'll snap it into place. And we'll cut the remaining piece on the ground. As you can see, this material cuts easily with ordinary hand tools. OK, and we'll put cement on the end cap and put it into place. Get a tight fit. And we're all set on this end, Norm. Looks terrific, Norm. Now I'll let it rain.
here in this upstairs bedroom, we're going to try to restore these old pine floors. Right, Norm? That's right, Bob. But you know, this is one of the most popular do-it-yourself projects. Yeah, and this is a special one because it's a real old floor. Incidentally, they only painted the perimeter of the room. Why waste any paint under the carpet? That's right. How do we get started? Right, the first thing that we have to do is take a nail set like this and set any nails that are close to the surface so that it won't ruin our sandpaper. What about over here, Norm, where you can actually hear it creaking? OK, Bob, what I'll do is add another nail, because what's happened is that because the wood is so dry, the nails have lost their grip. Not every floor has a shoe molding around the edge that meets the baseboard. That's right, Bob. But since it's so easy to remove, it'll make sanding the edges easier. Now, in order to restore these floors, we rented two types of sanding machines, and we bought Sandpaper. That's right, we have three grades of sandpaper, coarse, medium, and fine. And we'll use the edger first, right? That's right, the edger is the first thing. It's a disc sander, which allows us to go right up against our baseboard. And it rides on a set of casters in the back. And on the front, we have to control it with our hands so that we get a nice, even cut along the surface of the wood. Yeah, that'll control the depth of the cut. Right. Now, for these corners that the edger cannot get, we'll just use a regular scraper and remove the paint. That little machine does a terrific job in hard to get at corners. But now, for the main part of the floor, we'll use a drum sander. That's right. We'll use this drum sander with the same grit of sandpaper that we used on the edger. And what we do is, following the manufacturer's instructions, we put this paper on the drum, slipping it into the groove, and then we tighten it down by means of these lugs. OK. Now, this sander weighs about 125 pounds. So the most important thing is that we constantly keep it moving. Because if we were to let it set in one spot, that drum would just go right down through the floor. And you always want to move in the same direction as the grain of the wood. That's right, always parallel to the grain. What we'll do is we'll start up here with the drum off the floor. As we move back, we'll set it down and just keep a steady speed across. Now, I'll put the cord up over my shoulder so that it doesn't get in my way as I go. has managed to take off two garbage bags full of sawdust and paint. That's right. That coarse paper takes it down real quick, but it is also a little bit too rough. Right. So now we'll use a medium grit paper on both the edger and the drum sander and go over the entire floor again. OK. Now, we've run the medium grit throughout the room, and now we're ready to do the same process with the fine grit. Okay, that's nice and smooth. Okay, are you ready for the vacuum cleaner? We are. This is the most important part. We've got to vacuum this two or three times if we have to to get every speck of dust off this floor. Before we even think about putting down a finish. That's right. All right, Norm, that gets all the dust up. Okay, Bob. Now, we don't want to ruin all this nice work we've done sanding with a cheap floor finish. Mm -hmm. Any good quality finish is going to cost you about $20 a gallon, and it's worth every penny of it. Now, this particular manufacturer recommends that we use a primer coat, 
which will apply with this mohair roller. And we'll use a real fine bristle brush that won't give up any of its bristles on that finish. That's right. You know what I love? The cracks and the nail holes and the tack marks. It really gives it that antique character. You can't buy a floor like that. Okay, that primer coat has taken an hour to dry and you'll begin to see some of the beautiful honey color of this old New England pine. What's that tool you're using, Nor? Well, Bob, this is just a pole sand. It's something that drywall is generally used. Mm -hmm. I just have a fine sandpaper on here just to smooth out the surface. Great. Now, with all the dust up from that light sanding, we're ready for the first coat of hard finish. You know, on these final coats, we don't want to use excessive brushing or rolling. Why not? Because if we do that, we'll end up with air bubbles in the surface. Right. Speaking of air, it's also real important to have all the windows open so that you've got lots of ventilation. Well, we'll let this coat dry overnight, and then we'll hit it first thing in the morning with the final coat. Super. Ah. Feels dry, Norm. That's good. What's next? Okay, well, I've got the sander here with a fresh piece of paper on it. Just give it a light sanding. Okay. I'll get the vacuum, and then we'll be ready for another coat. For the final coat. That's right. Well, Norm, it looks fantastic. Two days worth of work, but a job worth doing. Oh, without a doubt. Well, Norm, that's about all the home improvement projects we can get onto this cassette. Remember, folks, take your time. Be patient, don't rush. Use the tape as a guide and enjoy. And you'll be more than satisfied because you did the work yourself. And watch for more upcoming video cassettes from all the gang at this old house.